Hi friends, I'm so glad you've joined me today. Today we're talking about the relationship between the law and salvation. You ready to get started? This is an important one. Hi friends, I'm Miss Nancy Bruce. And I'm Mr. Roger. We want to see kids living for Jesus. So let's start with the law. Typically, the law refers to um, the first five books of the Bible or the Pentateuch, um, also called the Torah. But sometimes, like in Psalm 119, the law just refers to God's word as a whole, the whole Bible. But we're going to talk specifically what we think of usually when we think of the law, which is the Pentateuch or the Torah or the first five books, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That includes the Ten Commandments. That's what we usually think of. But there's also a whole lot more to it in those five books. To, uh, most of it is contained in Exodus through Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a retelling of everything in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Okay? There's also something to be aware of. There's what's called the written law and the oral law. So in Jewish tradition, they have the written law, which is the Torah or the Pentateuch, um, those first five books. But they also have the oral law, which has been passed down teachings on the written law, explaining it and giving a little bit more codification or clarification about how to do these kinds of things. And that's the oral law. It's not written. It's passed down through this, these teachings um, over the um, generations. Okay. Um, Matthew, I mean, uh, Jesus refers to this oral law a few times, and we'll see what his reactions to this were. Um, this is Matthew 15, 2 through 6. It says, why your disciples break the tradition of the elders? This is um, the Pharisees talking to Jesus. They don't wash their hands before they eat. This is talking about the oral law. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? So he's pitting um, the oral law against the written law and saying the written law is the one that really matters. The oral law you've, you've made equal or even greater than the written law, and that's not how God designed it. He said, for God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what they might, what might have been used, try that again. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they're not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Wow, that's harsh. <laughs> but it's, it's a good word for us. Okay, here we go. Here's another one um, talking about oral law and written law. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they came, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions such as washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the, the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that at the end of this discussion of salvation and law. So this is really important. Grab this here. I'm going to read it again. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. That is the oral law. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. And just to clarify, um, Moses was the one that wrote it down and told the people, but these are things that God told Moses to tell to the people, just to be clear there. Okay, so going on, uh, verse 11. But you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Ah, that's just explaining further what we saw in Matthew, but that's, that's a problem. And so we're going to talk mostly about the written law then, instead of the oral law. We're going to focus on the written law. All right, let's start with Jewish views about the law. All right, first, um, there's a lot of teaching that says obedience to the law is Judaism. That's what it sets Israel apart from the nations. And there are some scriptures that um, point to that. Secondly, 
Um, this became even more a part of the Jewish identity in the face of persecution. Um, first and second Maccabees um, explains some um, persecution that happened before, the, not long before Jesus was um, born and, and started his ministry. Um, and it was some severe persecution against the Jews by the Romans, I believe it was. Okay, so they hunkered down and said even more what it means to be Jews, to hold on to the law. And that became even more so after the destruction of the temple in AD 70. You have to remember that the temple was a key part of the Jewish practice. You know, so many parts of the Torah of what they were supposed to do was linked to things that happened at the temple or at the tabernacle. And without the temple, they had to adapt and do things without it. That was a major blow to the Jewish people in AD 70 when the temple was destroyed. Um, and so they became even more, so they couldn't tie their identity to the temple, so they tied it to obedience to the law instead, the Jewish identity. All right, this is really interesting um, twist on this. In addition, they believed that the obedience to the law could usher in the end times, establish a new covenant, and bring the advent of the promised Messiah. And they point to scriptures like Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. That is really interesting because as they were trying to obey the law and latching on even more after the time of the Maccabees, it's so interesting because that's when the new covenant covenant was ushered in. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's keep going with our discussion. Now, the main problem with the law is that it really is a pass fail system. There's not a whole lot of room for grace. Either you're guilty or you're innocent. There is really no in between. It's pass fail. And as we know from Romans 3.23 and from our own human experience, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God or fall short of his perfect standard, which is outlined in the law. Um, see, it works kind of like this. Um, when you fall short of that standard, it's called sin. Sin is anything you think, say, do or don't do that breaks God's law is different from what he says to do. And sin makes our hearts dark and dirty with sin like this muddy tire. And the problem is when we have sin in our hearts and in our lives, we cannot enter God's presence. And there's nothing we can do to clean this up on our own. That's a big problem. And so, you know, um, God gave a few things in the law that people could do to kind of temporarily fix things, kind of patched up with a Band-Aid, but it wasn't a permanent fix. And that's a problem. So why do we have the law? Romans 5.20 says the law was brought in so that trespass might increase. Yikes, how does that work? Well, it was kind of like a mirror. When you read the law, it's kind of like looking into a mirror and you say, oh my goodness, I've done that and that and that and oh, I do have sin. It's like holding up a mirror so we can see it for ourselves. Um, this is really interesting here in Romans 7, 14 to 25. This is in the New Testament. This is Paul as he's looking at the law and trying to figure out how all this works. Listen, we know that the law is spiritual but I am unspiritual, soul is the slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. Now keep in mind, Paul was trained as a Pharisee. He knew the law very well. He knew the oral law and the written law, and he did his very, very best to live by that law. And by human standards, he was doing a really good job. But look what he says. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do, what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good because he's saying, yes, that was wrong. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. What's challenging is we are still under condemnation because we are the ones that acted out of that sin. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that is living in me that does it. And yet in God's eyes, there's not a difference. We still fall under that condemnation. But it make, it, he's describing that, that difficulty that we have. We know the right thing to do, but we just can't do it all the time. And that's a common human experience and a big problem. And that's part of what the law shows us. Oh, here we go. Kind of finish this verse. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do evil, although I want to do good, sorry, evil is right there with me. 
For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to do what's right. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we're going to definitely talk about that. But I want you to hear that struggle. It's a very common human struggle in, within every human being. That struggle of we know what's good and we just can't do it all the time. And here's the deal. Because we can't do it all the time, we face that condemnation. Condemnation just means judge says you're guilty. That's condemnation. Okay? And we all face that. But there's hope. That hope is the hope of salvation. We know that in order to enter God's presence, we have to be perfect, absolutely without sin and perfect. We see that in several places. One good example is Isaiah 6. In order for that to happen, all that dark and dirty stuff, all that dark and dirty sin that muddies our heart has to be washed clean and made pristine and perfect. Here's how that happens. Um, this is Acts 2, 37 to 38. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. John 3, 16 through 18 says it this way, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not be condemned, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. John, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, that means we tell on ourselves to God. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I want to go back and clarify that confess. It's not just telling on ourselves to God, but it's repenting, which means turning away and um, expressing genuine sorrow that we have disobeyed God and broken his law for, and asking for forgiveness, admitting that we have fallen short. And this is what happens when we do it. John continues, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All that muddy sin is washed away. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this is the next part. Not only do we escape condemnation, we are justified, which means the judge, the 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 perfect and fair judge, the Lord God Almighty, pronounces us not guilty because we confessed our sins and believe, believed in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But it doesn't just stop there. Watch this. Um, Galatians 2.16 2, says, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified in faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because the works of the law, by those works, no one will be justified. Romans 5, 8 to 10. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while our hearts were still that yucky, dirty, muddy mess, Christ died for us since we have now been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? That's that condemnation, that, that pronounced guilty. So we are no longer guilty in God's eyes. We are pronounced not guilty, justified in Christ Jesus. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life, the life of Jesus Christ? See, here's how this works. Um, it's not just a matter of um, God saying, okay, well, I'll, I'll let that one slide. That's not a fair God. Instead, this is how it works. Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. He did everything perfect. He never sinned, not even once. And there are other ways that he also fulfilled the law. Check this out. Romans 10, 4. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. 
Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. No, no. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Matthew 5, 20 says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpass that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, people like Paul, who were really good at following these rules, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So how does this work? How can our righteousness be even better than that? Yeah, God forgives our sins in Jesus Christ, but there's more than that. Watch. Two things happen when we are justified by faith in Christ Jesus. Here's the first one. Our sins are forgiven. Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And we also read other verses about that before, but that's just a little reminder of that. Second thing is, God imputes God's righteousness to us. And that's a fancy word, but what it means is, not only are our sins taken away as far as the east is from the west, but God also gives us Christ's righteousness. It's kind of like a special robe you put on, a special outfit you put on. It doesn't belong to you, it belongs to Jesus. But be, he, you get to put it on because you're made him righteous. Okay, so it's like instead of clothes, it's righteousness. So not only are our sins forgiven, but God takes Jesus' righteousness and puts it on us so that we become God's right, uh, Christ's righteousness. So here's, I'm not explaining it very well. Let's look at what scripture says. They'll do a better job. Isaiah 61, 10. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in robes of his righteousness. Romans 3, 21 to 22. But now apart from the law of righteousness of God, try that again. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. If you want a more scholarly description of um, this relationship, this is an excerpt from um, John Barry's um, article in Faith Life Study Bible. He says, Paul's somewhat ambivalent remarks about the law's importance stem from his need to simultaneously affirm the law as divine revelation while emphasizing its true theological functions. Number one, to point to Christ. Number two, to bring the knowledge of sin. In Paul's view, observance of the law has never intended was never intended to be the final means for people to attain righteousness before God. Faith was a greater standard than works and has been established as far back as Abraham. Now, um, these scholarly things are helpful, but really, really we want to go to God's word and see what God's word says about it, not what other people say about God's word. But this is really interesting here because he has a point that faith is a greater standard and it goes all the way back to Abraham. Check this out. I love this. This is so exciting. Genesis 15, 6, Abram believed the Lord and he credited, credited it to him as righteousness. So this is even before the law was given. And God set his standard of, I want, God wants heart obedience. And that is what matters. He wants us um, to come to him and give him all of us and all of our heart. And that's been the case all the way since Abraham well before the law was even given. And you see traces of this through the Old Testament, and then it's more explicitly spelled out in a few places in the prophets and then in the New Testament. But look at this. Okay, so here's explaining what this means in Genesis, a, a New Testament view of it. Hebrews 11, 49, 39 to 40, and then um, I skipped to ver chapter 12, verse 1, and did chapter 12, verse 2, because it explains. So here we go. These were all commended. We are just finishing up. Hebrews 11 lists a whole bunch of people in the Old Testament who demonstrated faith. And then it sums up with this statement. These were all commended for their faith, including Abram. Yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us so that they, only together with us, would be made perfect, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And that's what we've been talking about all along. Confession of sin has been the same all the way through the Old and New Testament. That's part of the sacrificial system. That's part of what David did in Psalm 51 and all the way through. But this imputed, imputing Christ's righteousness to us is something that was promised in the Old Testament and was fulfilled in Christ. That is super exciting. So all of this begs the question, does the law still apply for Christians? Well, 
Look at this. This is Romans 7, 12. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Jesus said, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In order to understand this, um, it's helpful to look at the different types of laws in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, in those first five books. There were ceremonial instructions, there were judicial law, um, and there was moral law. So the ceremonial law are things like um, the priestly garb and rituals and sacrifices and things like that. Um, this, the New Testament speaks to this in regards to the New Covenant. Um, here's a passage that's quoting, actually quoting the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 31. But this is from Hebrews 6, 8, 7 and 8. For if that first commandment had been free from a fault, no circumstances would have been sought for a second. But in for in finding fault with the people, remember we all fell short of God's perfect standard? That's what this is talking about. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will bring about a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Luke 22, 20, Jesus is um, speaking here. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Now, the interesting thing about the old covenant is um, the, the wages of sin is death. And we see that in Romans 20, 3, 23. We also know that um, sin cannot be paid for without a sacrifice of blood. And so Jesus is tying right into the old covenant when he's bringing in the new. There's no longer the need of the blood of goats and lambs and, and things like that because Jesus paid that sacrifice once and for all in this new covenant. And we see that here again in Hebrews 12, 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood of Jesus. So that he's the one that brought not only is he the sacrifice in the new covenant, he's the mediator like Moses and he's the high priest. He's all those things. Remember, Jesus fulfilled the law completely. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself because here it is in Hebrews 5, 4, 5, sorry, Hebrews 9, 15. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since the death, since a death has taken place for the redemption of the violations that were committed under the first covenant, in other words, sin, <laughs> um, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Inheritance, And remember, that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, confession of sin and believing in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is so interesting. I love looking at the book of Hebrews, especially alongside the law, because there's several ways that Jesus fulfilled that law. This is just the ones in Hebrews. Jesus is greater than Moses, who was the mediator, mediator between God and the people to give the people God's law. Jesus is the great high priest. He's greater than Melchizedek, who came in and left, and he was a uh, king and a priest. He, Jesus, uh, not only that, but there is a greater and more perfect tabernacle than the one that they built in the Old Testament times. And the temple was built upon um, that outline, but in a more permanent building rather than a tent. Also, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. And Christ's sacrifice was once and for all. This is the new covenant. And so we see that Jesus completely fulfilled all the ceremonial instructions. Jesus took care of all of that. And all of that has um, moved into the new covenant. Well, what about the judicial law, which is the civil laws and enforcements? Um, remember, not only were, uh, was God telling the people how to worship him, the ceremonial instructions, and the moral law, how to uh, live a, a good life, he also was setting up the nation of Israel. So they needed to know, you know, what are their civic laws and responsibilities? What punishments, what's the consequences for certain things? That is the judicial law, the civil laws and enforcements. This is things like Exodus 21, 23 through 25. Um, you may be familiar with part of this, but if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as penalty life for life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, foot for a foot, burn for a burn, wound for a wound, and bruise for a bruise. Um, but we see here in Romans 10, 4, but Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
Exodus 21, 23 through 25 says, oh, we already did that one. Sorry, there's a duplicate slide in there. Um, this is part of what Paul was talking about when he got so irritated with some of the Christian leaders because they were trying to put parts of this Jewish law imposed upon Gentile believers, saying, yes, you believe in Jesus, so you are saved, but you also need to do these things to be saved. <laughs> and, and that's not what scripture says. Um, in fact, um, to the right here are some, to, this to my right, I think it's to your left, the um, references talk about this conflict in the church about what to do. Um, and then, I'm sorry, we got a squeaky chair here. Um, then Galatians 2, 15 to 16 says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ Jesus and not by works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So these kind of customs, Jewish customs and things that set the Jewish people apart from the rest of the nations is not things that are imposed upon Gentile believers, people like me that are not Jewish. Okay, so this is the civil law, and this is um, part of what the Old, New Testament nullifies for Christians. It says in Matthew 15, 17 to 20, and this is Jesus speaking again. Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is, in, is eliminated? What he's talking about here is there are some parts of the Jewish law that say you can eat this, but you can't eat this kind of thing. All right, um, and there's more about this if you look at the... Um, I didn't write down this reference, but in Acts where Paul has the vision before he goes to uh, visit, <laughs> I can't think of the guy's name either. Anyway, he has a dream where Annette comes down with all these kinds of food that um, the Jewish law says not to eat and God tells him to kill and eat. And that's what this ties into. So Jesus is speaking to this. Um, I'll put that reference um, in the description when I think of it. <laughs> all right, so here we go. Jesus says, verse 18 but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart and those things defile the person for out of the heart come evil thoughts murders acts of adultery other immoral sexual acts thefts false testimony slanderous statements these are the things that defile the person but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person okay what he's talking about here is the difference uh come on there it is the difference between the judicial law and the moral law. The moral law still holds, and we will get back to that. But I want to jump back to the things. He keeps sticking on that one. I love that graphic, but we're not there yet. Okay, so here we go. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. So those Christian leaders who were saying, yes, salvation in Jesus is by faith, but you also need to do these things to be saved. That's not what scripture says. You can't work your way to heaven. And anyone who teaches that is missing this. All right. <laughs> Here's this fun graphic. Um, I love this from Galatians 4, 1 through 5, 1. And we're not going to read the whole thing, but we will read the last verse. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. That yoke of slavery is um, an image Paul likes to use a lot in the, the books of the Bible that God had him write. And it's this idea that all these rules and regulations and it's like a crushing weight on top of you saying, oh, I can't do all these things. And like we've seen, we can't keep the law perfectly. That's part of being a human being <laughs> is sin and not being able to do this. And when you start adding those burdens on top of you or on top of somebody else, you're being crushed under that weight. That's not what God has designed. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not because of works. Um, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit more moving on. Um, this is an interesting verse around here. And I especially want to pull this out because we are free from this crushing weight of the law. But does that mean it's a free for all and we can do whatever we want? Not really. Listen up. This is Romans 6, 14 through 18. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Far from it. That's as emphatic a no as you can get. Do you not know that the one to whom you present yourselves as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the same one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of 
obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that through But thanks be to God that through though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were entrusted. And after being freed from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. What this is saying is when we're released from that bondage of sin, we put ourselves in grace under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we seek to honor him and obey him, not to obey our sinful desires. That's what this is trying to say. Or I should say what it says. So let's look at this moral law because that's kind of we're getting into that gray area between the two. Let's be really clear. What is the moral law? This is stuff that comes from the heart. So Jesus summed it up in the great commandments, Mark 12, 28 through 34. Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is the greatest commandment, and it sums up the entire moral law. If you look at the Ten Commandments, you can sum those up with the same thing. The Ten Commandments do address moral law. That's why Christians often teach those. And interestingly, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus went through several of those commands and said, well, you've heard this, and you're given this lip service, but let me tell you what it really means. And he drills down to the heart behind that commandment and God's heart for what he desires for for us to do and it includes our thoughts it includes our minds it includes our hearts our desires and it includes also our actions so that's really interesting there um, scripture puts it another way too it's called spiritual fruit or out of the heart springs these kinds of things we see this in psalm 1 psalm 19 psalm 119 galatians 5 22 through 23 james 2 14 through 26 and john 15 1 through 17 talks about how we can achieve this spiritual fruit and it comes by abiding in christ we also when we ask jesus to be our lord and savior the holy spirit comes to live within us and we've done a whole video about the work of the holy spirit as described in john and so be sure you check that out but he works within us to make us more like jesus his job is to, to convict us of sin to remind us of god's teaching to guide and direct us to help us understand scripture and to make us more like Jesus. And the fancy word for that is sanctification, becoming more like Jesus. If you're curious about further reading and some academic articles on this, here's what I studied to get ready for this presentation. But I want to end with just a prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the law, for showing us our sin. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus who took our punishment for that sin. Lord, we, we turn to you today. We confess our sins before you. We believe in you as our Lord and Savior, that you came and lived a perfect life, died on the cross to take our punishment for sin, and came back to life again three days later so that we could be, be made right with the Lord, with God. We ask, Lord, that you would work in our hearts and lives. Make us more like Jesus. I ask that you would give us your heart to love as you love and to serve as you serve. Show us, Father, how we can best honor you. We love you, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'll see you next time, friends. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this with your friends. See you next time.